Business PNG. My name is Emma Rapana, I'm your host, and with me I have Miss Caroline Blacklock. She's the Country Manager, IFC, International Finance Corporation, the World Bank. Now Caroline, we understand that IFC is the private sector arm of the World Bank. Can you please explain uh, to, to our viewers the role of the IFC and in particular its function within Papua New Guinea? Sure, thanks Emma, thanks for having me on the show. So IFC is the International Finance Corporation which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. We are primarily concerned with ending poverty, improving people's lives through the private sector. And primarily in Papua New Guinea what that involves is creating jobs. So we know that from around the world when you ask people what they most want in improving their lives, they want a job. So in Papua New Guinea our work is in two areas, one is in investment services where we operate very much like an investment bank where we provide unique financial services products, everything from um, equity and quasi equity and subordinated debt and debt and all sorts of fancy financial instruments to provide companies with the ability to advance and explore and, and expand their services in Papua New Guinea. And in doing so, they create jobs and pay taxes and contribute to the society that is in Papua New Guinea. That's what IFC believes and that's our mandate to improve lives of Papua New Guineans. In addition to that, we also work very much like our de development partners such as AusAid and World Bank, but we deliberately work in areas where it's enhancing private sector investment. So, for instance, we fund in Papua New Guinea alternate dispute resolution to move commercial cases through the courts quicker. We fund things like um, the SME tax review inside the tax department to make it simpler for self-assessment to take place for small and medium enterprises. We were instrumental in designing the SME risk share facility to enable small business, including women-owned businesses, to get access to finance. We are an investor in Bank South Pacific, we're an investor to Digicel, we're an investor to PNG Microfinance Limited, KK Kingston and Ecom. So that gives you everything from coffee through to um, ICT, through to mobile telecommunications. That's the work that IFC does in Papua New Guinea. Now tell me some of the challenges that you, you face uh, in terms of um, conducting um, work within the, within the private sector in those key areas that you've just mentioned. Look, quite frankly, Emma, um, my job is one of the easiest in the world. Um, in Papua New Guinea, the GDP growth and, and the private sector growth is just so strong that in fact it's saying no, that's the hardest. It's really making sure that the people we do business with are the types of companies who genuinely are committed to creating long-term growth, to looking after the environment, to looking after the social aspects of what is business. So we want companies who are very much interested in doing good and doing well. So we're all for profits. Mm -hmm. In the 56 years that IFC has been in existence, we've always made money and we take great pride in that because it means that we pick winners. We pick winning companies and investments that we know are going to contribute both to society but also contribute back profitability. And that profitability enables us to contribute each year to the, um, the International Development Association, which is the world's poorest companies under, uh, countries under World Bank. And so the challenge for us is really making sure that the companies who ask for our help are the sorts of companies that we can help with and who meet our criteria, very strict investment criteria, remembering that we're owned by the governments of the world. Mm. So in terms of transparency and ethics and standards, we are the absolute pinnacle. And really it's not that a company's um, not doing some good things, it may just be that we really can't quite fit at this time to, to supporting their needs. So saying no is probably my greatest challenge. Uh, I think for Papua New Guinea, the greatest challenge is to ensure that we make sure that we take this natural resources boom, this extractors boom, and transfer the wealth across the community. It's, um, you know, I fell in love with Papua New Guinea in 2004, and I fell in love with the fact that it's still a community, it's a village, and that people want to give to each other, and that by accumulating wealth, the reason for doing that is so that you can give more. And I think that in the natural resources boom, what we're not quite seeing at the moment is the filtering down across all people, the wealth. And I think for many, very many Papua New Guineans, they find that frustrating. That in fact, life is not easier because of all this GDP growth. In fact, life has probably got a little bit harder. 
it's harder to access health services, it's harder to get a job in some cases, it's harder to graduate your business out of being informal to formal. And so they're probably the things that I find most frustrating in my role. And I understand that the World Bank and IFC, being the private arm of the World Bank, are doing some research in landowner companies. Could you share with some insight into that? Um, yeah, so we're doing a couple of things. One is direct investment, because we certainly believe that actually having to be crude skin in the game, you know, to really make sure that our money is at the table when landowner companies are investing. So there are two investments as we speak tonight, which are under review. Um, we also have a third, which is to directly to a Papua New Guinean Indigenous business owner. Um, it'll be our very first investment in agriculture, and it will be a very first investment to a Papua New Guinean. And that is, um, I can't speak publicly about who it is and what the business is, but it's, um, it's in coffee and it will support a great many people in Chimbu province. And those are the sorts of investments that mm. they're not always easy to do. I mean, this is a business that didn't have audited financial accounts 12 months ago. And by working with them long and hard, we've actually really helped, I think, transform that company. Uh, hopefully our money will also go into that company and help it transform into a great many other things, but um, they're the sorts of things we're doing. Secondly, we're partnering with the World Bank. Every year, um, the World Bank, through the World Development Report, produces a report called the World Development Report, and this year it's on jobs, and featured is Papua New Guinea, and featured is Papua New Guinea landowner companies. So there's a piece of research that's gone on to do with that, which will soon reach the world. Thanks very much, Caroline, for coming on the show with me this evening and gaining some insight into what IFC uh, are doing in the country. Thanks, Emma. And after the break, I have with me Mr. Alex Precker, also from the IFC. Welcome back, viewers. This is Business PNG, and with me, I have Mr. Alexander Pricker, who is the Head of Health and Industry Policy Analysis, World Bank, a highly credentialed and well respected within the field of health and economics. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for inviting uh, me here today. And I believe the, uh, the area that you work in, the Investment Climate Department of the World Bank Group, this is the unit that provides policy advice and technical assistance to strengthen the operating environment for improved private engagement in the health sector in development countries, is that? Yes, that's correct. In the World Bank, we work right across the health sector. So we're very active in working with governments on helping them with policies that will uh, help facilitate better mm -hmm. uh, health care for populations. And also in the private sector, as you heard from my colleague, uh, we're active in working directly with businesses uh, in supporting them uh, in areas where they can also make a contribution to health care. We in the Investment Climate Department sit somewhere between those two and what we do is we try to facilitate uh, good government policies, good government regulations so that businesses can do and contribute to uh, uh, the health care in, in the countries where we're working. And how do you see, how can businesses help deliver health care in Papua New Guinea? Well, it's very exciting what we're seeing across the world today. Um, uh, we're definitely seeing a trend toward the public and private sector working much closer together in health care. Uh, in recent years, we've seen the private sector get very involved in a range of activities uh, mm -hmm. from primary care, doing better outreach to poor populations in rural areas, to more urban health care and health care clinics, and also at the hospital sector. Um, but we're also seeing exciting new developments in other areas, such as uh, helping with some of the administrative functions of health care systems, uh, improving the way health care systems are run, the management side, and then we're also seeing uh, the private sector get much more involved now in what I would call the manufacturing sector, coming up with new and better solutions, uh, lower cost solutions for things like pharmaceuticals, medical technology, which before we didn't think was so important, but mm -hmm. now as we're beginning to become more active in low-income countries and where the technologies from the US and Europe don't always fit so well uh, in a setting like Papua New Guinea, we're very excited to see the uh, private sector get involved in those areas and exploring new ways to uh, find uh, solutions for those kind of contexts. So we're very excited in seeing how the private sector is getting involved across a range of uh, areas in the, uh, in the healthcare system. And how can the government partner with the private sector to assist in the provision of investment in healthcare delivery? So I think this is another area where the world has changed a lot in the last 10 years mm -hmm. where 
uh, there was a period where governments thought that they uh, should and could uh, provide all of health care to the population. And I think as we have moved along, um, uh, more and more many governments are beginning to realize that you can see with two eyes and you can work with two hands. And the idea there is that you can use the public and private sector, you can use the uh, strength and the innovation of both sectors to work in harmony. So what we're finding in many countries is that they, uh, governments are increasingly becoming involved in helping the private sector uh, do what they do the best, which is reach out to populations often in areas where maybe the governments don't have the penetration, like rural areas, like areas where you maybe can't have a public clinic in every, uh, in every village where you find there are new and innovative uh, um, things done by the private sector, mobile health uh, uh, and those kind of things. And what the governments can do is they can provide a contract so that those private sector actors um, can serve the poor population uh, in such a way that it's affordable. Uh, and often it has to do with a government commitment to some sort of a program that's subsidized, which then the government can buy services from the private sector. Now, Alex, how can the government encourage communities to be more involved so that both parties can benefit from the healthcare system in this country? So I think this is another area where, particularly in recent years, we're now beginning to have a much better sense of how governments and the private sector can work together. And I think the, in, in a case like Papua New Guinea, one of the key things is that currently Papua New Guinea is uh, spending a quite small amount on health care. And there's definite scope for greater investment both on the public side and on the private side. So both parties can be uh, contributing more on the financial side toward health care. Um, uh, the government on its side uh, can focus its resources on the people who can't afford to uh, pay their own care. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very important that the scarce money that the government has goes into some sort of a program that helps subsidize the care for the poor. In parallel to that, the private sector can get much more active in uh, providing services that could be bought with the money that the, that the government puts forward. So by putting together some innovative uh, financing mechanisms together with the resources that are already there, I think we have a great opportunity for improving health care uh, for the population in Papua New Guinea. So you're talking about the distribu distribution of health care across the country. What about the skill sets of these people that need to ensure that the um, uh, that the people are being treated in hospitals, so like your doctors and nurses, uh, are you involved in any program with the upskilling? So the upscaling is the big challenge, I think, in many countries, and Papua New Guinea is no, no exception. There's a shortage of staff, and this is an area that goes beyond the health sector. So it's an, it's a, it's an area where uh, the health sector has to work closely with the education sector and, uh, and other parts of the economy. And so I think this is part of the, the challenge that also faces Papua New Guinea right now. There's a shortage, there's a great shortage of staff. There's not enough doctors, there's, there's not enough nurses. nurses. So this is an area for future investment, not just in the healthcare system, but also in the education system. Now, what, opportun what opportunities should be developed for businesses in PNG to contribute to the health sector? So in order for the um, uh, private sector to uh, be able to work better with uh, uh, the public sector, uh, often one of the first things that we find is that uh, there has to be some way for them to, uh, whether it's for-profit or NGO, mm -hmm. there has to be some way for them to be able to serve people uh, in such a way that's affordable to those people. Yeah. Um, and this is where I come back to the idea of some financing mechanism like an insurance program. If you, um, we've recently had an, uh, a program we supported in Ghana where uh, the government came in with a subsidized insurance program, uh, any uh, person in the population that was below a certain level, the government would pay their premium. Mm -hmm. They then belong to the program, and then when they went to the private sector, they would be able to uh, uh, take advantage of those private services that were there. Now, you could envision a similar program, it doesn't have to be insurance, but you could envision a similar program in Papua New Guinea, where in the poor areas, the government could empower those, uh, uh, those poor populations to go to whichever services they felt were of the best quality mm -hmm. and then be able to access that without having to have a financial barrier. That becomes an important part of the access to the private sector is removing the financial barrier. And then the second part, which I think is a really important part, is often many countries have a lot of rules and regulations that were uh, put in place over time for reasons 
uh, that are historical, but which are no longer appropriate. So one of the things that we're encouraging many countries is to look back over some of the uh, uh, regulations and the regulatory framework for the private sector and come up with a, a, a regulatory framework that encourages businesses and NGOs to work in the health space and not just uh, discourage them, which has often been the case in the past. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for your time this evening and sharing with us some great work that the ISC, through, through your department, what you're doing uh, in terms of the healthcare sector. Welcome viewers this evening on Business PNG. I have Mr. Ivan Pomelo from IPA. Thank Good you evening. for coming on the show, sir. Thank you very much. Now, IPA, um, for, the, for the interest of our viewers, what does it stand for? Uh, the IPA stands for the Investment Promotion Authority um, of Papua New Guinea. It was established in 1993. Uh, prior to that, it was known as the National Investment Development Authority, and uh, that was scrapped in 1993 when the new legislation was uh, enacted by Parliament. And what is the role of the IPA? Our role under legislation is to promote and uh, facilitate investments uh, into and within the country. And that obviously speaks of a dual role, one being to promote foreign investments coming in to Papua New Guinea and to promote the businesses and investment activities within, within the country. And what have been some of the challenges for IPA? Um, I guess, uh, I guess uh, in the business of promoting investment dollars, you, you really need to be thinking what, what does the environment uh, provide? How easy it is to uh, bring investments into this country? What uh, makes investors make decisions to come to this country? What are the key elements in terms of the decision making that we need to address to ensure that they come into this country? So the challenges again, I guess, would be thinking in terms of what, what makes investment tick? How do we make it uh, relevant? How do we make it uh, easy for investors to come into this country so you you got to start thinking in terms of uh, investment policies making it attractive uh, in the environment you got to think in terms of how entry requirements could be simplified to to make uh, new companies come in and uh, and stay uh, for the long haul um, and then also think about how you uh, bring the message across to uh, those who perhaps do not know uh, what this country can offer. So it entails some backroom work in terms of uh, uh, policy development, legislative review, simplification of procedures, but it also entails getting the messages out there uh, about what Papua New Guinea can offer uh, in terms of investments. from foreign investment, encouraging foreign investment into the country. Um, I guess for those local business, um, for our people out there, if they wish to set up businesses, is this the avenue and the channel that they should be coming through? Yes, I, I guess um, when we start talking about local investment, we want to tell them what the procedures are, how does one get to register a company, how does the service, um, how, how can we deliver the services better? Uh, how can we make uh, the services accessible to, to those who would like to do business? So uh, with, with respect to domestic investments, we, we try to make sure that our regulatory services, our registration services are simplified so they could uh, be able to come in and uh, and, and create their companies and, and, and go to the banks and borrow money and look at the opportunities to the, that are there. In, in, in some ways we also do a bit of uh, matchmaking. If there's an opportunity there and if, if, uh, if a local investor 
uh, is interested to look for a joint venture partner, we have some role to actually uh, mm -hmm. match make. And in, in terms of uh, the processes and procedures, um, can you share with our viewers what steps they need to take? Yes, uh, for a foreign company, basically, um, uh, to come into Papua New Guinea, you come over and register a company under the Companies Act, then we can take you through the steps of being certified as a foreign company, um, and then they can start looking at opportunities that are there in the marketplace. So there's a two-step process that the IPA is involved in. Mm -hmm registration of a company to create it to make it come into being and then there's the um, there's the certification process that permits a foreign company to be uh, doing business in Papua New Guinea. In, in, in terms of domestic investments you can come in uh, do your registrations and then uh, go out and, and look at opportunities that are there to uh, uh, do business. Of course, um, the, when, when, when a company or business is created, the whole issue of taxation flows in as well. So there are, um, there are taxation uh, compliance requirements that, that, that one needs to take account of. There are banking <coughs> services that then comes into play once those uh, entities are created and, and brought into being. And does the entity IPA, um, has it gone out to educate perhaps? Yes, we, we, we carry promotional market? activities, we, we, we do our visits to provinces, we, uh, for the most sophisticated of our marketplace, we carry a large amount of information on our website. Uh, that takes you from steps one to step Z if, if there's a need to um, uh, take you through those steps. So information that carried out, admittedly um, promotion uh, needs to go where people can understand. So mm -hmm. to some extent we need to continue to simplify it. But I, I got to say that uh, there's a, a, a certain level of awareness in, in Papua New Guinea specifically that uh, people actually over the last 10 years have uh, become aware of what's required. Uh, you could tell that by the fact that the, the growth in the registration of new companies is, is phenomenal. It's actually increasing on a daily basis. It to me demonstrates that people are aware of what processes are there. Uh, as I said, I, I think there's, there's a certain level of awareness with respect to the requirements. Uh, um, I think uh, our, our bit is probably not the challenge, um, but the, uh, what you do after that, that, that continues to uh, be a challenge for a lot of people. And I'm sort of talk, uh, talking in terms of uh, business advisory services, perhaps credit facilities that could become a, a little bit more available for people that like to do businesses. Um, uh, smelling the opportunities uh, in terms of the big developments, what are the key things you could extract and say, okay, this is an opportunity that I'd like to become involved in. So it takes a bit of skill to, to actually know what's there and, and, and go after it. Now, um what message would you like to leave for our foreign investors wishing to invest in our country, Papua New Guinea? I think the message that we continue to drive for our foreign uh, friends and foreign uh, investors is the fact that uh, Papua New Guinea offers enormous opportunities for, for investments in various sectors, uh, in forestry, in fisheries, in, in the mining and the petroleum sector, we've seen phenomenal growth in those areas. It, it, it means there's a lot of activity going on. Explorations in the mining and petroleum sector is, is enormous. It, 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 it continues to be a very robust program and we feel that there's enormous opportunities for a lot more people to become involved. We believe the policies that the government has, uh, has in place are are friendly, they, they encourage investments the, uh, in terms of facilitation. We have an organization like ours, for instance, that actually can do a lot of work to bring new players into the marketplace. So our message is there, come to Papua New Guinea and, and, and check it out for yourself. You, you might actually find some opportunities that you're interested in. Thank you so much for being on the segment tonight. And that, that was Mr. Ivan Pomelau. Managing Director of IPA Investment Promotion Authority. Thank you.